guys. Um, Don't worry about it. Take two. Take two from the top. Hello, I'm Dust Mephisto, and welcome to the World of Warcraft Cinematics Q&A. Today, I'm joined by Mark Messenger and Taryn Gregory. Would you like Would you like to start off and introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Taryn Gregory, and I am the lead cinematic narrative designer on the World of Warcraft team. Um, I work on the in-game cinematics, anything that you've seen of uh, playing in the world, usually looking like the game itself, all the way back to Burn, uh, Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King with Wrathgate, all the way through today with many of the raid finales, trailers, even some of the uh, promotional materials like the Gnome and Goblins that we did, um, but mostly in the, in the tied in-game content and the real-time content that's been coming to bear uh, more recently. How about you, Mark? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Mark Messenger, and I'm a cinematic director with story and franchise development. We're kind of the story hub for all the, the games. And um, I've been directing at Blizzard, uh, well, I, close to 14 years. Um, I started on um, Cataclysm and I've basically been directing the announcement pieces uh, ever since, with the exception of um, the Shadowlands Sylvanas piece, which was done by our good friend, uh, Brian Horn. Um, mm -hmm. But apart from that, I, that's really been my gig for the last number of years. That and, um, and of course, the, the Sarfang series, um, I was uh, very much involved in that as well. So, and, and several of the series. Lords of War and several of the Afterlives pieces. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. I've also been very involved in a lot of the, um, what we call 2.5D or the moving paintings uh, pieces mm -hmm. that uh, that we love to do. Yeah, the, the, the Afterlives was a lot of fun. I got to do one of those with Bastion. You did uh, Ardenweald mm -hmm. and Revendreth. And Revendreth was just uh, such a good such a good piece. No, it's fun. Um, so back to you, Des. All right, let's go ahead and dive right into these questions. Is there a specific line of thought after Zappy Boy and the community excitement around Zappy Boy that has gone into creating strong bonds to characters we don't know in cinematics? In BFA, we had Tink Tink and her side, a side eye towards Sylvanas, oh, yeah. as well as uh, now in Dragonflight, we have Watcher Kornos. Um, is there like a specific way that you guys go about this? Stony Danza, yes. That's a funny question. That's cool. That's a cool question because, <laughs> you know, with Zappy Boy, I mean, we didn't see that coming. I mean, we were already working on the old soldier film when the whole Zappy Boy thing hit. And yeah. we were just excited, you know, because it was like, oh my gosh, it's they're it's liking the character we're already film, we're right? already using more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I don't know what you think, Taryn. I don't consciously you know, try to, you know, like elevate a character towards being, you know, something that catches on. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a function of the story that we're telling. I mean, the, yeah. um, the, the banner carrier was very much a function of there needed to be somebody standing next to Sylvanas who could hear what no one else could hear when she said under her breath, right. you know, the horde is nothing, right? Um, that was just important. It was a catalyst moment that we needed in order to make that story work. Um, but that said, then you want to invest these characters with some emotional equity, you know, and, um, uh, you know, certainly that was the intention with uh, Watcher Kornos, right? And I think that there's something nice about working with a new character that, you know, nobody knows anything about them. So in a way, it's kind of freeing. You can really get people to invest in someone from the ground up. Um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think, Karen? Um, that being said, we, we are fully aware of what cinematics can do for a character, sure. right? Like there's a power to when a character appears in a cinematic, they're instantly elevated. And so some of the more obscure characters, if they appear in a cinematic, they'll jump all the way from whatever tier they were at, all the way right up to B tier, A tier, <laughs> S tier, just because they're suddenly in the limelight. And we saw that during BFA where uh, Matthias Shaw on the Alliance SI7, he was, a you know, maybe B character a lot of people knew him but he'd never had a spotlight and when he started showing up in the cinematics at the right hand of you know all the characters and gen grayman and what he instantly boom became really prevalent within the community and that's a power and it's a power that we can use to our advantage when we're wanting some of uh uh the more uh, obscure characters to enter their place in the prime prime limelight so yeah, yeah. awesome all right, so what goes into creating the narrative theme for a cinematic trailer? In Shadowlands, it was very character-specific with Sylvanas 
and then in the dragon flight we we see it almost very sewn specific so to speak so it's it's almost like shadowlands was setting up sylvanas as a threat whereas dragon flight seems to be setting it up as an adventure yeah um i think we first started talking about dragon flight like <laughs> a good long while ago year year and a half maybe even two years ago uh that's the duration by which we're trying to you know think about these things in advance and one of the tricks I think with uh, Dragonflight was that it's meant to be a homecoming. You know, the dragons are coming home to their islands, but it's a place the viewer has never been to. So how can we make a homecoming to a place that we don't know? We needed a, a vector into that. We needed someone whose home it is to, to welcome them back, which kind of resulted in the Watcher Coronos bit. But thematically, you know, it bears resemblance to Miss of Pandaria, which is another wonderful movie that Mark directed, uh, in the sense that in the wake of cataclysm, dark, broody, destructive dragons, it felt like we needed to take a breath of fresh air, uh, kind of relax all the hypertension. And I think very much the same with Shadowlands as far as like, there will be threats, there will be conflicts, but for the, for the first flavor of, of, of Dragonflight, for the first flavor of this new land, let's take a moment, let's, let's get back to uh, walking in and give us a opportunity to discover, you know, what we're going to be facing here, much like we did in Miss of Pandaria. How about you, Mark? I couldn't have said it better myself. You know, <laughs> ultimately, I think it's just each expansion has its own personality, and we work with the game team to try to figure out what that is, and how best to you know condense that into something that uh, that people can get excited about? What were some of the core themes that you chased for uh, the Dragonflight cinematic as you were putting it together, Mark? Oh, you know, definitely homecoming. Certainly, the idea of the land is awakening. You know, uh, the you know, and and we wanted Koronos to be sort of an everyman. You know, like he's sort of us, right, going on this journey. Um, you know, so we wanted it to feel very personal. Um, uh, you know, I tend to feel that um, the dragons are more, I hope this is true, that the dragons are more emotional when you see them because you've been on a journey with somebody who actually wants them to return and cares whether it all works out or not. And we've kept you in suspense for a while. So hopefully, you will feel those feelings that, you know, that, that we feel, you know, that excitement, that thrill, the, you know, just sort of the, the rush of this high fantasy icon coming back, you know, so yeah. that, that was and, our intention anyway. And really quick, candidly, you know, when, when we start these movies so long ago, the community hadn't yet started speculating or talking about, you know, what the next expansion is going to be. And so there was a slyness as far as like, we're going to soft hand and like, we're going to wait, 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 wait for it. Now show the dragons, you know, at the end. Little did we know that once the movie came around, a lot of people were like, it's it's dragons. We're, we're, we're so excited. And so the mechanism by which people are like, there wasn't a lot of combat. Like, oh, well, we couldn't have known a year ago that a lot of people would be expecting dragons. Um, but I think it, it played well none, nonetheless. Yeah, I, I think someone on Twitter actually called it back in January of 2021, where it was just dragons, 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 dragons. <laughs> nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. Uh, Nizoth uh, on Twitter. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Speaking of which, I nailed it. Mark, all of your uh, hopes and dreams on like getting that across. I think you guys nailed it. Absolutely. I think it was very um, obvious. A lot of that emotional connection definitely came through. Oh, thank you. So... <laughs> Given the level of complexity in cinematics, how do you tackle changes to the story beats if something happens when you're mid semantic? Like, like, you know, oh, we actually want to change the story, but you've already written most of the cinematic. How does that change? It is a challenge. Absolutely. You know, it's something that is just part of the job um, because uh, especially for these announcement movies, we have to get out in front by a year or even a little more sometimes in order to deliver at the proper time. Um, but that means that when we're in our initial story development for a movie like that, um, the game team is often frantically, furiously working to get the final patch out for the last expansion or whatever. And so they are also in very early stages of development. And sometimes the thing that we thought we were going to do, you know, game development is very organic and sometimes things go a different way. And it's really, it's just a collaboration between our group and the game team to say, okay, look, we've made a change. Now, 
let's all put our heads together and try to figure out, you know, can we pivot easily? Is this a bigger deal? Is this something that's going to require a big rethink? Or maybe we can solve this, you know, simply through dialogue. Um, you know, those are just, that's just part of the gig, really. Right, yeah. Taryn? It's a heavily, heavily iterative process already. Uh, the movie we set out at the beginning to make is very rarely resembles a whole lot of the movie we end up at the end. And some people might think, well, don't you guys have a master plan? I'm like, the master plan comes from the iteration. It's, mm -hmm. it's not something that we're granted, uh, you know, uh, clairvoyance before and then have an architecture. The architecture is the process. The process is the iteration. Finding the story is just as important as building something off the uh, off thing. The key is to try to have most of that on the front end. So once you've reached a certain threshold, the later it gets, the more harmful the changes are. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, uh, what do you find to be the hardest thing about creating cinematics that connect with the audience? The Nazoth cutscene is one that seems to have had a lot of mixed reception with the community, despite trying to include the character more. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting subject. Uh, on, on, the, on the subject of the Nazoth finale, um, we were coming off of the uh, Legion, right? Legion was incredibly, a lot of people have really, really good memories of Legion. It ended very strongly. 7.2, the ending with uh, Kill Jaden, really strong ending. Uh, Sargeras stabbing the world. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it set almost an impossibly high bar for us. And so over nine releases of the game, we have to try new things. We have to get some variety within what we're creating. So as we were approaching the Nazoth finale, we had new technology coming on with our real-time cutscenes, being able to harness the player. And it had long been feedback that, hey, I don't like when, say, Thrall steps in and kill steals the boss. I wish it was me. And so Nazoth was largely driven by player feedback. That doesn't always mean that it's going to succeed. We were trying something new, uh, adapting new technologies, bringing variation. And some people really enjoyed the idea that their character, and we've heard the feedback that some people didn't like it as much because, hey, I didn't win that, my raid team did. Why wasn't all 25 of us combining together? That's great feedback. We couldn't have known when we were trying it at first. Um, and then we've, we now understand a little bit more the balance between like, there's always gonna be some degree of of different, differing opinions. Some, some people would love to just watch the heroes do amazing things because Warcraft has done that a lot. Other times they wanna feel more included. And I think the only solution to that is for us to continue to try the variety of expressing this different ways. Some are gonna work, some are not, but we're always learning every single time and we hope to bring a lot of those lessons into Dragonflight. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I will say, uh, going to face the Jailer and you cross that bridge and you see your entire guild or raid going right to face him with you, very cool and epic moment, right? It feels very good to see everyone included in that, you know, yourself, but it, it's that team-driven aspect. Really, really love that. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit, Mark, about, um, you know, really trying to make sure that what you're building is, is universal, <laughs> you know, to make sure it's not in the inside baseball? Yeah, I mean, I think that's always on our radar. You know, there's always that balance. You know, we like to say, what if I've only been playing WoW for a week, you know, and I don't know all this stuff yet. You know, can I still follow this? Can I get invested in these characters that I don't know very well yet? Um, but we also have to make movies that satisfy the diehards that don't, you know, um, talk down to anyone, you know. So, you know, that is a really difficult balance to strike. And, you know, sometimes we knock it out of the park and sometimes we stumble. Um, and I won't say which times were which, but, um, uh, but yeah, it is definitely one of our bigger challenges. Um, in Shadowlands, during the Judgment of Sylvanas, we saw the first introduction, and at least as far as I know, of real-time cutscenes. So if you were a night elf, your character would be shown when Tarana says, and my people. Are there any mm -hmm. exciting ways you're planning to use this in Dragonflight? Yeah, so as I mentioned, WoW has been evolving slowly but surely, end over end, year after year, in every different facet. It can be challenging, you know, an 18-year-old game is going to present unique challenges compared to a game that's probably doesn't have to be built on all the layers of the tree that WoW has been on. Um, but it does grow organically, and in-game cinematics have, you know, come from when we had in-game videos first introduced with the Wrathgate, and then it was around Legion where we started doing some of the in-game 
real-time scenes with like Illidan, Illidan's Origins, I think was the first series we really did. Uh, very simple scripted scenes. Um, they caught on and then we saw more of them during BFA and then Shadowlands, I think we turned to refinement. We realized that there was, you know, some issues with either the age of the, um, of the engine and we've been looking for uh, tools to enhance that. And the first one we saw was at the very beginning, it was an experimental test when Anduin held the line in the Maw. That was, the, we, 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 we really duct tape and bailing wired that together. Can this work? And when it fired and there was the cinematic Anduin turning to the player and saying, go get out of here. It felt like, oh, this is the future, right? This is where we want to go. Um, but it's still early. Right? I, I, I refer to that as a, that was an experimental rocket ship. <laughs> now that we've proven that it can work, we need to build the infrastructure around it to make sure that we can use it more um, without breaking ourselves. And so throughout Shadowlands, we tried it a couple more times while we were still doing major beats with the, the video uh, pre-rendered technology. And then we felt really confident going into the judgment of Sylvanas. This is where we're really going to see if it shines. And both scenes run, running five minutes long were done entirely in real time with cinematic characters, cinematic animations. And a lot of people were convinced that this just looked like an in-game cinematic, like you guys did it uh, the rest of the way. And so, so we consider that very successful. And we're very, very much looking forward to uh, continuing the trajectory and bringing more uh, moments like this during the dragon flight experience. Um, yeah, using every tool at our disposal. That is so awesome. I am incredibly looking forward to that because when, when I heard about this, it just it added a whole extra layer to WoW. Like you actually felt that more immersion. And like, I mean, to me, this is one of the coolest concepts, right? Like actually seeing your character there, like you're actually acknowledged as one of the, the victims in this. And it's, it's huge. Like it, it yeah. just totally brings the storytelling to another level. Yeah. And it's definitely something we've always wanted to do. Um, but we, we, we needed to, to catch up on some of the, of the technologies. WoW didn't have um, cinematics in it when it launched. Vanilla, Burning Crusade, none, right? So we, we have in, in many ways been playing a little bit of catch up and trying to find ways to make the engine do things that it was not built to do uh, at first. And that's why the videos were that solution. And now trying to bring it into the real time space, um, it's, it's gonna slowly evolve and there will be evolutions that are gonna happen in the future that I hope even uh, get people even more excited. Um, but little by little, time by time, WoW is an ever growing, ever evolving uh, product. Awesome. Uh, so similar to, to 4 earlier, there's been huge technological advances in the game with uh, cutscenes. Are these baked mesh animations or have you <laughs> taken face rigs fully into the in-game engine? It's a very, very technical question. I think for the most part, it does just, just bake out the caches. I don't think uh, our rigs exist in the game files, but <laughs> let's not get too too down into the weeds on that one. <laughs> yeah, this this is something I don't know anything about. It's just a question that I saw from um, some like All good. cinematic All enthusiasts. All uh, good. You know, Machina, right? Like, Machinima. Uh, Machinima, yeah. yeah. Um, but like this was something they were excited and interested about. So I was like, I'll, I'll try and ask it, but I don't... <laughs> um, good. Are there any plans to do something like the Shadowlands Afterlife shorts for Dragonflight? Uh, yeah, I was just in the recording booth earlier today, so answers <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is definitely happening. They've been uh, wonderfully successful. We've we've loved what they've done uh, all the way back to Shao Hao and the way that they provide additional context and additional uh, groundwork. Uh, we're definitely going to be seeing uh, a series like that, uh, the 2.5D motion uh, motion paintings for for Dragonflight. Mm -hmm. That's going to be awesome. Like I can just imagine it now for each of the different Dragonflights. Oh, that could. Oh, that's going to be really, really <laughs> cool. Um, so in in the cinematic, we see blow blue blow blue glowing water. Uh, when Watcher Kornos awakens 10 years later. This this is Azerite, right? And in the cinematic, Alex Straza says, you will feel our return in the waking of the land when we see this. Um, so, like, is that is that not? Because I know this has been kind of a question in the community as well. Uh, well, yeah. the, the land is waking up. 
mm-hmm. the, it has been healing. Like think of all the stuff that Azeroth uh, has gone through in the last few years between the sword and then we did everything we could to, to help stem the wound, uh, siphoning the poison out of it with our artifact weapons and then dealing with the threat of Nazoth and all of that stuff. Those have all been things that have been hurting Azeroth and yet some time has passed and now it's she's, maybe she's starting to feel a little bit better and the world itself is starting to become more vibrant. And then Mark, you know, the question was, how is that vibrance going to affect the island? Yeah, I mean, our intention was always that it was simply bioluminescence because everything is waking up. So all the organisms in the water around the coast are coming to life. Um, And, um, you know, I mean, I I think it's perfectly fair to have guessed that it was Azerite, but, uh, but that wasn't actually our intention. Gotcha. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard from the community was specifically that it was supposed to be symbolic of each of the flights. So you start with the blue and then you saw the uh, flower blooming for, for life. Like that was one of the other theories that I saw as well. That's cool. That's cool. I don't know if anybody caught the little ribbons of uh, lit nebulas in the clouds as Karnos is trying to pull the two blades shut. Um, and in the distance, in the in the clouds, you see little bits of color of of the aspect colors. Um, yeah. That was also intentional to uh, to give us that feeling that they're out there, they're banging yeah. on the door, but they don't know where, they don't know how to get in. Yeah, I, I think I was tearing up when I first saw the wide shot of him down there, but then you start to see a little bit of blue, a little bit of green in the sky, and it's just like they're breaking through. Stony, keep going. You're almost there, buddy. <laughs> it's just. I did not notice that at all. I, I was I was watching the cinematic over and over again, like looking for questions to ask, and I completely missed that. It's, it's one of the things that's so beautiful about these cinematics is there's always so many layers, and you never know if something's intentional or not. But I think that's one of the the beautiful beautiful things about this. Um, awesome. All right. So, what is the name of the big Titan Keeper style Watcher on the throne in Tirhold? Taryn, do you know what his name is? I haven't. Uh, heard. So, you know, a lot of people are, are thinking maybe that's Tear. It's Tear Hold. Yeah, Tear was missing, not. you know, hard. well, Tear <laughs> fell. Tear fell and tears fall in tear is fall. Right. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the greatest sentence of all time, right? Tear fell and tears fall and tear is fall. Um, so that's where he's set to rest. Uh, so, in essence, remember the time scale. Right, they uh, the watchers were left behind at the behest of uh, Alex Raza. We leave it to you. We're going to war. The world has been sundered, and they're left behind in a bubble. When so much time passed, what are they thinking? No communication. Uh, the dragons might have all died. They might have lost that war, right? So that might have been informing in the sense of like they just m- losing hope and, and shutting down. Um, so really, it was whatever keeper you know probably lost to the records of time stood up in the loss of tear and was watching tears fall was making sure the uh, the beacon would be lit but we're talking about a lot of time for hope to be lost for the dragons to ever return yeah yeah and i totally understand how people might think it was tear i mean the evidence you know could point in that direction some of it um the you know he is missing an arm um but uh you know but honestly the you know the camera angle is what dictated the breakage that we would do on him. And we needed to very quickly have you be able to track when you saw the shot. It's not a long shot. And we wanted you to be able to immediately get, oh, he's all fallen apart. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not, not there. Coming back. Yeah. And so losing that arm was just like the most obvious thing that we could do to show breakage. And so that's kind of... Because they're made of stone, so we can't make them skeletal. That would just be weird. <laughs> gotcha, okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if there was some kind of like intentional parallel like just you know since Tyr lost the hand as well right and we have like a lot of norse mythology themes so it it seemed like there were yeah. some parallels there that might have been intentional but okay i feel it because there's it's like a happen. million intentional things that we do and then there's a whole ton of other things that are just necessities or you know just artistic choices you know and absolutely and who knows which is which so it's good to ask <laughs> i guess gotcha. um given the problems of the pandemic was there originally a plan to do a cinematic series in the same line of the Sarfang ones for Shadowlands? Is this something you'd like to do again in the future? Uh, well, we love doing those movies. Uh, you know, one of the highlights of my career. 
Uh, the pandemic didn't really enter into it. That has not been a huge issue, I, I think, uh, in that way. Um, you know, honestly, I think it really is always just going to come down to the same philosophy, which is we take every expansion as it is, and we have these different tools that we can use, and we decide based on logistics, based on the story, and what would be the most valuable things to get out into the public consciousness. And, you know, so I think every expansion is going to be different in terms of the choices that we make. You know, we like to experiment, and we hope that we won't, you know, do a bunch of experiments that then are always expected, you know, well, we'll always do this now. Well, you know, okay. maybe we want to do something else next time. So right. I don't know, Taryn, would you agree with that stuff? No, no absolutely. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it can be difficult. The Sarfang series, of course, we enjoyed it. The audience enjoyed it. We, we, <laughs> we'd love to make as much content as we can make forever. Like we are the artists that want to make it all. Um, but it has to be to the need of the product at the time. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the Sarfang series just aligned very, very perfectly in the sense it of really like, did. It followed two characters and when in, in Sarfang in a series of specific uh, uh, beats, which makes it more practical to create and makes it su uh, support throughout the narrative. Um, but it was also a big I won't call it gamble, but it was a gambit. This is big, right? We did all these movies to say that, well, we have, you know, we've now set the bar and we have to do all of that every single time. We wouldn't actually have the freedom to take those risks to do really cool stuff if we knew that, well, we can't, we have to do this every time forever. Um, so some things are gonna be exceptional and um, that does not preclude the notion that in the future, should the need arise, should the opportunity for the stars align where we could look to do something like this, we'd love to do that again. Uh, but as of right now, there's really not uh, plans to do something like it, but silver uh, lining on that cloud is like, even Shadowlands had more cinematics than uh, they used to before Battle for Azeroth, right? There used to be one big CGI, there was two for Shadowlands. Um, so it's all about perspective, number, and how they're being used. Um, and we'd, we'd love to do cool things again in the future regarding that. Is that about right, Mark? Yeah, we just want to, you know, do whatever we can do to, you know, tell an awesome story. Yeah. Um, we we all want more That can take different story. forms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cinematic trailers have been becoming longer. Uh, I think I looked back at Cataclysm and it was about two and a half minutes, where Shadowlands and Dragonfly are slightly over five minutes each. Um, how long does it take to make? Is there any desire to do longer cinematics? Um, well, the first part is that it takes usually a little less than a year, somewhere between nine and 11 months to get one of these done from first iteration where we're just talking about the idea to when Blizzard Video actually delivers all the final frames. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they've gotten a little longer over the years uh, because they've become a little more story driven than they used to be. You know, Cataclysm um, has a story, but it's a trailer, you know. I mean, you, you, you know, it's, it, it's pretty simple to follow it. You know, it has one through line destroying things. Um, uh, whereas, you know, things like, uh, you know, the Sylvanas piece or the Kornos piece or, you know, um, even the Battle for Azeroth trailer, which I think is one of our most successful ones personally, um, uh, certainly at balancing um, excitement for both the Horde and the Alliance and making sure that there's equity on both sides and yet it doesn't feel like you know, I hope it feels kind of effortless the way that, you know, that it all came together. Um, but, you know, even that movie was starting to get longer because, you know, it, it wasn't just a trailer, it was a scene, you know. So I think that's kind of what happens is when you start to go a little more narrative, a little more story focused, um, then it requires a little more time because emotionally, I think your emotions only work at a certain rate like you need to process something and it needs to go into the right centers of your brain and it needs to you know then you know get that thrill you know um so i think it just takes takes a little longer with those movies yeah all right absolutely and uh just just an, as a pen on that we did have an opportunity to make a couple longer you know uh igc's in-game cinematics for 9.2 i think people probably noticed that when we leaned into sylvanas uh, and Uther, right? That, that movie was much, much longer than many of the other IGCs we've mm -hmm. done. Um, but this goes back to the earlier question about when it's needed, 
right? There's times when the story demands more time that it needs this touch in order to get across what we need to do. And that movie was definitely up there as far as like, we're tackling this subject matter between Uther and, and Sylvanas. We're not gonna push this all the way down as someone in our story room always said, 10 pounds of story in a three pound bag. Uh, well, maybe we can get it into a seven pound bag, right? But that's why that movie ended up being like, I think four and a half minutes long, which uh, rung up there with the longest movies we've made like The Wrathgate. So um, it's always what we feel the story needs to be to tell the story effectively. And as Mark said, to absorb it. So, cool. Awesome. Uh, one last question before we have to go here, and it'll be a short one. Is there a reason why Shadowform doesn't persist for in-game cutscenes with characters? <laughs> That's the last question. <laughs> Is that uh, not short? Oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. It, 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 I mean, I, it's, a, it's a great last question. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. It's, it's like, Shadowform. I was not expecting it. That's what I meant to say. I was not expecting that to be the last question. Well, it's very um, character-specific. Yeah, so so for the real-time uh, cutscenes where you see your player in the game, um, behind the scenes, you know, on, an, on a game engine level, you're not actually seeing your character. It, it kind of clones the scene. And so you're seeing a shadow apparition of yourself uh, in the cameras, we call them local, local actors. And those local actors have to be able to inherit all the parameters from your character. And some of the, uh, there might be a bug, this might be a bug, thank you. I'll talk to the, <laughs> our designers about like, hey, why aren't the, uh, scene script actors inheriting the appearance from priests when they're in shadow form. We'll figure, we'll look into that. Maybe there's a technological limitation, um, but it's also affected things like um, whether you're in animal forms or if you have enchantments on your weapons, right? Like these are all things that have to be inherited correctly um, by the shadow version of yourself in the scene. And yeah, it's classic game development. <laughs> Little ticky tacky things you would never think about come to bear as far as like, Oh, I see how that might go awry. <laughs> carbon, carbon copy and pull it off. You don't get the whole newspaper on one side. <laughs> you just get the bits that stuck. So cool. I hope that uh, is interesting. <laughs> yes, actually, that is very interesting. Uh, Mark, Taryn, that's the end of our time together. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah. I, I cannot thank you enough. This was an absolutely fantastic interview. And uh, I hope you both have a wonderful day. Sorry, go ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Des. This it was our pleasure. Day. Uh, for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Thank you for showing up uh, and listening to us uh, geek out. Um, I hope you all enjoy Dragonflight when it comes around and uh, stay tuned.